Hi, uh, welcome. My name's Amy Kinsel. I'm Dean of Social Sciences and Library here at Shoreline. And it is really my great honor and pleasure to introduce Jeanette Ediart and a panel of students. Uh, these students went with Jeanette to Barcelona on a study abroad this fall. And uh, we have five students who are on that trip. She'll introduce the students. First, I'd like to say a few words about Jeanette, who it is my uh, great pleasure to have team taught with in years past. And she's a really fabulous teacher of English. So uh, this was a quarter long study abroad and they went to the province of Catalonia in Spain and in Barcelona, which is the provincial capital, which voted for independence from Spain during their time in Spain. So what they got was not your usual study abroad and they're gonna tell you about it from their first-hand experience. So about Jeanette, she has been teaching English and literature at Shoreline since 2001. This is the first study abroad that she's led. And the students from the Barcelona trip who are with he us here today are Nico Suarez and Taylor Fox, Alana Simmons, Ella Nelson, and Mackenzie Leak. I have a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Emergency exits are in the back of the room and on the side of the room. This uh, event is being recorded for later viewing, so if there, during the Q&A portion, we ask that you use a microphone. And before you leave, complete the survey that's on your um, chair about this program. So now please join me in welcoming Jeanette Ediart and five students who went to Barcelona in the fall. When I was asked to um, give a talk on uh, our study abroad pro programs, adventures in Barcelona, I was very glad to do it, but I knew immediately that really it wasn't my story to tell, that it was my students' story to tell. So I reached out to um, our students and these five brave souls showed up, very eagerly though I might say, to share their amazing experiences. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce them once again and tell you what colleges they're from and then we will get with the program and I will just be the slide monkey. So that will be my role here. So this is Nico Suarez. Oh. He is a student here at Shoreline. Uh, Taylor Fox is also a student sh at Shoreline. Alana Simmons is a student at North Seattle. Ella, you're a student at Shoreline as well. We got a lot of Shoreline students. And then finally, Mackenzie Leak. She's a student at Edmonds Community College. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that um, we thought we are going to have, you know, just a regular study abroad adventure, but I, can, I can't emphasize enough that these students appeared in Barcelona exactly when the political situation in Catalonia blew up. And so they will get to tell you about their many adventures um, during that crisis. Take it away, Nico. All right. Well, to start with, to really understand the Catalan independence movement and why things went the way they did, you have to understand the background of Catalonia and its history with Spain. So to start with, Catalonia and the people of Catalonia are culturally and historically very distinct from the rest of Spain. And for centuries, you can see here's a map of Spain and Catalonia in the upper right corner. Historically, it's for centuries just been in conflict with Spain over its relationship with the rest of Spain. And in 1931, I'm skipping over a lot of history, but <laughs> this is the important stuff. In 1931, Spain stopped being a monarchy and declared itself to be a republic. Eight years later, that was taken away after the Spanish Civil War, which was won by a man named Francisco Franco. Francisco Franco took away Catalonia's autonomous status, which it had enjoyed under the Republic, and he made it just another Spanish province. He also went further and went so far as to ban Catalan language, which is distinct from standard Spanish. And he was particularly 
vicious with his political repression of Catalonia and the people of Catalonia because they had been fierce resistors of Franco during the three year long civil war from 1936 to 1939. After Franco's death in 1978, was it? Five. 1975, my bad. There was a transition to democracy under the restored king of Spain named Juan Carlos and there was a three-year transition to democracy and in 1978 there was a new constitution written that enshrined democracy but this constitution did something that has become the basis of the conflict in that there is a line in the constitution of Spain that declares the indissoluble unity of the Spanish nation and in 2010 to 2014, there were a few jabs at independence from, should I use this? Yeah. No, no, he doesn't no. use that. I was trying to tell you to pass that to me. Oh, oh. never mind. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So in 2010 to 2014, there were a few hiccups of independence, but there wasn't really a concerted effort. It was just sort of getting more popular. And then in 2015, and then 2017, there were two referendums on independence held in Catalonia. In 2015, there was a referendum held by a man named Artur Mas. He was the regional president of Catalonia at the time. He held a referendum, and I believe that it was something like, what, 40% turnout, same as the 2017 one. There's not a lot of difference between them, but in 2017, the referendum that was held did something specifically different in that the Catalan local parliament passed a law that stated, regardless of voter turnout, if a majority of people vote for independence, we will declare independence from Spain. And that happened on October 1st. They declared that they would hold a referendum a few months prior to that, but they scheduled it for October 1st and then they said, we'll declare independence if there's a majority for yes. And then the Spanish government repeatedly stated, we're not letting this happen, it's illegal, you're not declaring independence, all that. And then immediately prior to that, prior to the referendum, I mean, they sent in the national police to arrest several government officials in Catalonia who were organizing the referendum. So that caused a bit of a stir. There were protests over that. And one of the big things to keep in mind with all this is that a majority of Catalans want a referendum. Now, it's shaky as to whether or not a majority want independence, but a majority definitely want the right to vote on it. And the Spanish government is saying, you can't vote at all. So October 1st comes around, the referendum is held, and there's a lot of chaos about the voting. There's Spanish police, they're called the Guardia Civil. They're in the streets, they're taking voting boxes, they're arresting people, there's a lot of violence. I think hundreds of people are injured. Um, the only conflict about that between the Spanish government, the Catalan Guardian, is how many hundreds of people were injured, but there was a lot of violence regarding it, and there was a lot of just chaos, chaos everywhere. And after the referendum, the Catalan officials said 90% of people voted for independence, and there was about 42% voter turnout. So less than half of Catalans voted, but of those half, a vast majority of them voted to become independent. And between the referendum and just for the next month after it, there was a lot of back and forth between the government of Spain and the government of Catalonia. Um, the president of Catalonia, Charles Puigdemont, um, he made some comments about declaring independence and then immediately suspending that declaration of independence. It was very confusing and no one really knew um, where to go from there. But eventually what ends up happening is that the Catalan Parliament declared independence from Spain and then as soon as they did that, the Spanish government activated 
part of the Spanish Constitution, and it's called Article 155. They used that to suspend Catalan regional autonomy, and they took control of all the institutions. So the police, the firefighters, um, the local government, administration, all of that was now being administered directly from Madrid rather than Barcelona. And after that, after he did that, he declared, <clears throat> um, the Prime Minister of Spain, or the President of Spain, the, they use the same word, um, Mariano Rajoy, he said that there would be new regional elections scheduled for December 21st of that year, so 2017. When those regional elections came around, the Catalan voters returned to power the pro-independence party, so they kept a majority in the Catalan parliament. So they'd had that majority before, that's how they organized the referendum and all that, but they kept their majority after Rajoy called for new elections. Uh, I would like to add a few things to that. Uh, I just want to make sure we all understand that Catalonia, uh, which is the way that they pronounce it, is, um, is part of Spain. It just looks separate because they made it red, and I just don't want that <laughs> to get confused. It is, it is Spain. They're trying to secede from Spain. And also, um, the violence was, from what I personally experienced, um, was only on one re on the referendum. It was not on all the protests that were happening. Right. The violence just happened for the referendum. So I think that's important to get out there as well. So Taylor was um, lucky enough uh, to go with her host mother to vote in the referendum. And so she'll tell us a little bit about her experiences <coughs> of being um, at the referendum. Um, a couple of you will talk about that. And I'll get the slide working too as well. So to give you an idea, this is my beautiful host mom, by the way. Her name is Rosa. I took these photos. Um, to give you an idea of how soon after we arrived in Barcelona um, and the actual referendum, we arrived September 26th, and the vote was on October 1st. So this is right when we got there. Um, so myself and a few of my flatmates, we talked to my host mom the day of, and we were like, we really, really want to go with you. This is an experience that we have not like ever had ourselves in the United States and we want to experience this with you. And it's very important to note that she is Catalan and she's very, very pro-independence. So the first place that we went to was a few blocks away from our apartment and um, it was on a college campus and most of the places that you could vote at tended to be like public spaces like schools, libraries and just like easily accessible places. So we went a few blocks away to a college campus and there was a super long line and there were children, there were elderly people, there were young people, everyone was there. Um, so we went to that college campus and it actually got shut down while we were in line. Um, I did not see any police because we were so far back in line, there were so many people there, but um, that got shut down. And so we went to another place but we had to figure out where to go through this app called WhatsApp. Um, and it's basically an app that you can use to text people. Um, most of the information about marches and protests, and especially the referendum, was from other people messaging each other, because the government at the time was heavily influencing uh, the media. So you could not get trustworthy information from the news. So a lot of the information about where to go, we just got through my host mom's friends. So we arrive at the second place that we're at, um, which is the school is just over there in the background where all the people are. Um, and this was an elementary school and it had an entire gate around the whole place. And we went up to the person at the gate and we're like, we're here to vote. And so they unlocked the gate, let us in and then locked the gate again. And then we had to go through a second door which also people were guarding, and they had to unlock, let us in, and then lock it again. So you can imagine that the outside of the school was a very tense environment to be in. Um, but it was very amazing because once we got inside, people were so overjoyed. People were so happy that American students had come to witness what was happening. They said, this is our chance to show the world what we can do and show that democracy is important 
So they were so happy that we were there. Um, so that is my host mom with her ballot in the first photo. Um, and when she put her little ballot in, everybody clapped. It was really nice and pleasant and um, overall a really wonderful experience. And so then we leave. Um, and I took a photo of her in the outside, and I really want to make an emphasis on, in the background, you can see a lot of people sitting down. These are young people waiting for the police to arrive. And so what they're going to do is when the police arrive, and I don't think that they ever did, they were going to be a human shield so that the police could not get inside and take the voting ballots away. So um, you can imagine how tense and emotional it is for these people out here during this period of time. Um, but overall, I did not see a single police officer. Um, I did not witness any violence firsthand, um, which is something in other voting places around the city, there was violence, but not here and not in my experience. It was overall a really nice time. Um, and so another student who is not here also went to the voting. Um, and so I'm gonna read what she has to say about it. So this is from a student of Peninsula College. My host family stayed in the living room most of the day, watching in disbelief as the violence and protesting unfolded. My host mom just kept saying how all she wanted was peace. Then around lunchtime, 2 p.m., my host mom got up with a determined look on her face and put on her nice light blue jacket. She was going to vote. She invited me to come with her, and I eagerly agreed to go. We walked down the block to a school where there was a voting station. The line was long and the Mosos, the Catalan police, were stationed around the corner. The line moved slowly as elderly citizens are wheeled to the front to make sure that their vote is counted. And we waited for almost an hour. Students were singing El Segador's, the, Cat the Catalan national song, and the whole line was singing. Even the pro-secession as well as anti-secession still shared that sense of Catalan nationalism. Everyone was talking and beaming. Then the report came in that the Guardia Seville were on their way to our voting station. The atmosphere changed and became tense. My host mom immediately told me to go home and then left shortly afterwards herself, only 10 people away from voting. I think that many votes, like my host mom's vote, were not counted because of the fear that was invoked by the Guardia Seville. And most ironically, she was anti-secession. Looking back at my time in Barcelona, I remember this day and the countless marches, protests, and standouts that happened in the following months. The biggest point I would like to emphasize that was so starkly different than in the United States is that all the protests were nonviolent. There was never any need of fear of violence except from the Guardia Seville, which is Spain's national police and anti-secession could walk through a tide of pro-independence people and the crowds would part like the Red Sea. There was this respect from both sides on the citizen level. I think this is one of the greatest lessons I learned while in Barcelona, that two people that have diverse opinions could be able to coexist and express their opinions without feeling threatened. If the United States could adhere to this rule, think of the differences we could make. So I'll leave you with this final thought. Attempt to understand a different perspective other than your own. Then, even if you not, cannot comprehend it, at least be human enough to walk beside the other person in peace. Would you mind advancing the slide and hitting? Um, we're going to show you a brief video. Actually, would you mind skipping? Right, you could play that for a second. That's um, the day of the referendum. Did you take this, Alana? Yeah. Alana took this video. Do you want to just yeah. give him a tiny bit of context on that? Um, so this is the day of the referendum. This is in um, a place called Plaza Catalunya um, in Barcelona. Um, I didn't go to a polling station, but me and so many other people were here watching what was going on on the screen. You see police entering polling stations yeah. there. <laughs>
is a case of the Guardia Civil entering a polling station. My colleague, Alison Danson from Green River, who is my uh, co-instructor in Barcelona, took this video just below our apartment building at a school where polling was taking place. Hear the chanting. Picture. Was that you, Ella? Uh, I did. It was Mackenzie. Yeah. This is the two days after the referendum, and obviously people were really upset about the police brutality they were met with um, at the polls. So this demonstration day was in response to that, and this was the day we all had to walk to school, walk to and from <laughs> school, because the metro was closed. Most stores were closed, places of work. Um, my host family was pro-Spain, so the son in my family, he worked at, where did he, he worked He at, was like, he was a professional, yeah, he, he wore like a suit a really every nice day. Job, yeah. And he, this day he like did not leave the house in his suit because people would see that he was going to work. And they would like so, harass him. Yeah, so, it. well, I mean not harass, but yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> but he, so he left the house in like jeans and a t-shirt and went to work, but most people did strike on this day. Mm -hmm. And there was, a protest like yeah. in most places in the city. It was like it became really common to just get used to protests and strikes happening and like metros coming at weird times and, and yeah. taxis not, not running yeah. anymore. Oh, like, it was just it just became like normal <laughs> yeah. after a while. Like on this day, um, this was October 3rd. Yeah. Um, I remember we had to, oh yeah, this is my day. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is actually like down the street from our school because we had to walk to school this day because the metro wasn't working. I had to walk a mile. And this is all of the people down the street. This is like right next to our school that yeah. we studied at. This is actually how I got to school. I followed these people because I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We had to close our windows in school just so we wouldn't hear protests anymore. Yeah. Um, this is Mackenzie and I's host mom on the right, pro Spain. <laughs> she would um, she would have us bang pots and pans. So basically, what they did was to protest at, for example, nine o'clock p.m. People for Catalonia. They would hit pots and pans together, and that would show throughout like all of Barcelona, who is, it would be like whoever's loudest, right? And then at 10, it would be pro-Spain. And so I remember she had us hit pots and pans at 10 o'clock for pro-Spain, and we were like one of the only people doing it. And <laughs> we were so embarrassed. We're just sitting there like, we were trying so hard to get out of the situation. Yeah. Um, all our neighbors And she was so excited. She's like, yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so we would go, um, I think there might be a photo of us banging them, but I'm not really sure. But that's us in a protest. Um, 
<laughs> oh, this is right outside my, the next video is right outside my room. So this is on my balcony. And you'll hear my host mom in a second if the, if the oh sound plays. Oh, shit. You can't my brain. Give it back to my it's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> she is encouraging us to go out there. <laughs> She's like, let's go outside, let's go, come on. <laughs> Mackenzie, you can hear her say, it's too cold. <laughs> and that's one of three days that it rained while we were there. Yeah. And we were like, no, like, we don't want to go outside. <laughs> um, but that's oh. just typical. Yeah. <laughs> That's your, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So in my video, that was a um, pro-independence one, and this one is a um, pro-unity. Anti, yeah, anti-independence. Yeah, anti yeah. yeah anti-independence. Um, and I actually had to walk through one of these one day. I think the metro was open, mm -hmm. but there was like 350,000 people yeah. that were protesting, and I had to go through it because I really wanted to get my nails done. <laughs> And so it took, me, it took me like 30 minutes to get a block. I had to walk a yeah. block and it took me 30 minutes yeah. to get through it. But I made it and I got my nails done. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I think that just like explains um, what she just said, just explains how normal this was for us. Yeah. That she, that's the photo I took um, <laughs> on the balcony. That is Mackenzie. <laughs> and those are our other two roommates. Um, and then our other roommate, Liz, she's actually in the back on the left there. Um, Call her she on. was on a different window. <laughs> um, and then, so if you play yeah. the video, it, it's, you can yeah. kind of hear you the pops like You have to like listen really hard. Mm, not really. No, yeah. you can't hear you <laughs> but It's very faint, but explain. it's there. Yeah, you can't hear it. You, you can't, can't hear it. Yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. this is what, like, this is a video I got actually from my room. It was a lot louder. Like, the windows were closed. My door was closed. And you could see her all the honking and all of the pots and pans. And I was like, oh, Every my single God. night, too. It was like, yeah. every single night. It's, it's it well, because it, it was at 10 o'clock every night, because there's this general rule in the city that you cannot make noise after 10. Yeah. If you make noise after 10, they can call the police, and that can actually come and make you be quiet. So it was protesting this by doing it at like after 10 like we're being loud and we're showing everyone that we're being loud and so you would like know exactly what time it is if you're like up just like hanging out you know it's 10 because you can hear the pots and pans banging also, like it's like your little alarm system yeah. and it's just typical time to eat dinner there like nine ten <laughs> like everyone's yeah. awake so you know you're just you're, you hear yeah. it there's and a then, there's a, actually another reason as from uh we had another student who uh, was from Wenatchee, and uh, he actually came up with a, another reason that his uh, host mom gave him, and... For pot banging. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if I could read this, he can talk about uh, what it was like to listen to it um, when his host mom would go out and bang the pots. Every night at 10 p.m., she would get her wooden stirring spoon and her soup pot and head out to her balcony and just start clanging them together with everyone else in the neighborhood. I later found out that from her that they did this at 10 p.m. because that was when the Spanish president, Mariano Rajoy, would give televised speeches. <laughs> the number of people banging pots made it quite difficult to hear him. And when he asked his host mom why she did it, she was a 67-year-old single woman. She was very sweet. Um, she pretty much said that she did it to stand in solidarity with her fellow Catalonians. I believe this was after the referendum took place, so she was protesting the police violence as well. Uh, she doesn't like President Rajoy, but she wasn't blatantly pro-independence either. Um, my host family was a different story. They were very pro-independence. They wanted an independent Catalonia, and the 15-year-old <coughs> son that I stayed with um, every night would go out on the dot, 10 p.m., and just bang on the pots to say, ah, I don't like you, that kind of thing. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like um, having these huge political events, all these demonstrations and these strikes, while still carrying on in everyday oh, life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, Mackenzie, you had something to say about that. Um, yeah, it was funny because we, we wouldn't even be looking for a protest, and you just stumble upon <laughs> yeah. one. And, they, the headquarters of the Catalonian police were right around the corner from our school and they would have a lot of demonstrations outside of that. 
and one day I remember all of the Spanish police were up against the building and then they had a perimeter out in front of it where all of the Catalonia police were in front of them because they didn't want to put the Spanish police up against <laughs> the crowd because everyone was angry with them. So yeah, that was funny to see, but yeah, it was just yeah. crazy. Like, Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. But like you could tell, like they were just like they were just there, and you were just like, ah, oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go to sleep or I'm gonna go to school, whatever. <laughs> it happened again. You just like, always see flags. Like, oh my god, they were yeah. everywhere. I mean, they were on balconies, oh, yeah. yeah, people's backs. Oh, she has. Yeah. 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 So this here. right here is um, a flag for oh. the independence of um, the independence flag or whatever. Um, people used to like they would like wear it as capes on their back and like. Especially young like people, this. you would wear it around yeah. like that. And they that. would just walk like this and go and protest. Yeah, young mm -hmm. people were like very mm -hmm. politically involved too. And yeah. a lot of Barcelona, most of who I spoke with, um, I would like sit down in random restaurants and I would have conversations with people about um, what they thought. And everybody is politically involved. And they know not just their politics, but like world politics. And so that was something that was very interesting to me. Yeah. What was the core issue? There were, I would say that there were three big things that drove the independence movement. That's what you meant by the issues that they had. So the first one is language. Um, people in Catalonia don't speak Spanish as a primary language. They speak Catalan, which is sort of like if you took Spanish and French and put it together, but at the same time, no. <laughs> All you need to know is that they speak a different language than the rest of Spain, and not a lot of Spanish speakers really put in the effort to learn it. They think that it's kind of a waste of time. And that ties into um, the other two reasons. Uh, the second one is uh, people in Catalonia don't really feel like Sp the rest of Spain respects them. They feel like Spain sort of looks at them and takes them for granted and what a lot of people who supported independence really feel like is that they want Spain to hear them and they want them to realize that Catalonia is such a hugely important part of Spain and if they don't realize that then they want to leave and be their own country and the third big reason I'll get to you in just a second actually we'll, we'll save the questions to the Q&A at the end ah, okay so the third biggest reason that again ties into the other two is money. So Catalonia is one of the richest regions in all of Spain. I think that it's something like 19, 20% of Spain's GDP comes from Catalonia. So it is a big money maker for Spain. And if Catalonia left Spain, that would be, well, a disaster for the rest of Spain because Catalonia subsidizes the poor regions of Spain, kind of like how Washington tax dollars go to Mississippi, that sort of thing. And sort of a, on a related note, all of you wanted to talk about how your host families or what you learned from your host families right. about how they view the, the past, mm -hmm. uh, the Civil War, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, just the relationship more generally that the Spanish and the Catalans have with the past. And I know some of you had some stories about that. And I know in particular, um, Mackenzie, you wanted to speak about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, Ella and I's host mother, she was pro-Spain. She um, was older. She must have been 70. She was like 60. 70. Yeah. yeah, she was 70 years so old. So she like very much remembers Franco's regime. And she, part of our, one of our assignments with Allison, I was in inner class, but she, we had to interview our host family about uh, Franco and yeah. all of that. And she actually was a supporter of him. <laughs> one of the first things, so I had, I did a lot of like translation for interviews. So she always like would attack me just cause she thought that it was like all coming from me. <laughs> and so uh, I asked her, I was like, so what did you, cause the first interview we had was about um, LGBTQ rights. LGBTQ, and um, she was on board with everything. She said, you know, you can marry who you want to marry, da, 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 da. So then when Franco came up and I was ready, you know, I had the pen and paper because it was right after that first interview, I said, so what do you think about Franco? And she said, oh, I liked him a lot. And I just remember looking around and all her faces just like snapped up. We were like, did I hear that right? And so I, I re-asked her and then she started yelling at me. She was like, oh, you don't understand, da, 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 da. And then um, she said, one thing that stood out to us was she, she denied that he was a dictator and said that he was for democracy. 
Um, just, I don't know if everyone knows who Franco is here, but, um, oh yeah, you briefly said something about I him did, before. yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, he was, he was a dictator of Spain a long time ago, and he kind of paired with Hitler, and they did, like, all the stuff together and all that. Um, <laughs> and then she said, what really, she just said some bizarre things about him that just really caught our attention, because yeah. Arho's mom had a, it was a very different interview with him. I don't, was there anyone else who was for Franco? I think we no. were the only ones. What did yeah. she say? She said um, he brought order and everyone was safe then. Yeah, yeah. and it she was, was safe in the like in the streets. Is she, what she said. Yeah, and then she also said that he's um, he's basically just like a father disciplining his million or thousands of kids. <laughs> and um, she was just she was wild, but <laughs> she, um, we love her. But it was just um, it was very interesting. So when we came to class, and I had this little journal that I kept of like all the politics and our interviews and stuff. And, when we said it, it was just like we were the only ones who had the host mom like that. So we had a very, I think, unique experience in that sense. Um, but that was something, yeah. 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 And then this one day, um, we actually had a lecture come in for political science, um, our class with Allison. And the lecturer put up Franco's picture. But she was like, I can't leave this up for too long. And she left it up. It was like five seconds. And people were like crowding around the glass doors in the back. They were just like walking on the street. They walked by and they'd be like, oh, just like, like a minute. staring at random people. Because they don't, they don't teach by. anything about him in the oh, schools yeah. there. And he's like, it's such a, they just don't talk about him. And they're like, wait a minute. Like, oh, yeah, they don't teach about Franco in their schools. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just random people would walk so by and we would just see their face on the glass. And then we would all turn around and they'd be like, oh. And then so she had to, she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so we, yeah, we had to change the picture. Yeah. I waved to one of them and then they waved back. <laughs> and it happened the, the same thing when she put the king up, too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. was like, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> it's really crazy. Yeah. The king is not popular in Catalonia. Yes. No. no. Is there anything so, you had, your host family was more pro Catalan <coughs> independence? Yes, they were. And they also told me more about, like, um, they were old enough um, that they were in, I think, elementary school when Franco died. And uh, they said that. What they can remember was um, he would be on TV every now and then, and he would give these speeches, and it would play um, the national Spanish song. I forget what exactly it was called, but it was very like sort of military style um, admiration of Franco, and really the transition from democracy to that. Um, is in and of itself something of an impressive feat. As to what you said about how they felt about independence and the referendum, um, well, as I said, they were strongly pro-independence. And they told me that pretty much the reasons that I said before, it's like um, they didn't feel that Spain really respected them as a people, and they wanted to uh, assert their importance and really just stand up and say, hey, we matter too. And that sort of thing. Another thing is that a lot of people in Catalonia really don't like the current prime minister, uh, Mariano Rajoy. There's been, in the last decade, some uh, agreements between Spain and Catalonia. This was before elections that put Rajoy into power. Um, there was an agreement between the government of Spain and the government of Catalonia to give Catalonia even more autonomy. and. Mariano Rajoy's party, the Partido Popular, uh, challenged that on a constitutional basis for really no reason. And it went to the Spanish courts. And the courts are a very independent body in Spain. They're not political. They just go off of what they say. And they don't really adhere to anybody's political views. They said that the agreement that was made was unconstitutional and that it had to be struck out, and they got rid of it. And the thing was, a lot of it was just sort of feel-good laws. Like, it gave preference to the Catalan language in Catalonia, which makes sense. It established Catalonia as a, a nation, which they took issue with. Um, it didn't establish it as a state, which is sort of a different thing, but established the Catalonian nation. and. The Spanish courts didn't like that, and so they struck it out. A lot of people in Catalonia saw that as a bit of a slap in the face. They were like, why even fight us on this? This is disrespectful in a big way. So 
there's been a lot of back and forth in the last 10, 12 years between Catalonia and Spain, and it really just looks like the Spanish government, as it stands, does not respect Catalonia, and they want to make their voices heard and voice their dislike of Mariano Rajoy and his party, who are really the people who started this back in 2006. So that leads us to our last sort of topic or thing to consider. Oh, so the last question I have for you then is, how has your experience in Barcelona during a serious political crisis um, affected you? What did you learn? Um, so I want to preface this by saying what most people saw of our experience in the news and in TV was not how it was. Yeah, and that is something that we really want to make sure that people understand. Yeah. <laughs> the media showed the worst parts of it. Yeah, like the most violent, like the only violence that Which there was. Most of us didn't even witness, really. We just yeah. saw it later. Yeah, I mean, and, only on TV. and it's one of those things where when you're in a situation like this, there is a lot of political nuance that's going on. <laughs> there are people like, like there would be days where we thought that someone was gonna say something and they didn't, or they said something and they took it back. And there was a lot of waiting around. Sometimes it would be so slow. And you would talk to the citizens and it would be one of those things where they were just like, I'm just waiting for someone to do the right thing. I'm just waiting for someone to do something. We're just sitting here. And it could be very frustrating. Um, and so, one thing that like, I think that we've learned is when you're in an area where there is so much happening at once and you're so far from home, you're only hearing about the big political things that are happening back in your home country. So you realize that a lot of the things that people pay attention to in the US are so unimportant. They are so unimportant. But the bigger issues is what really matters. And when you're around people that are literally fighting to be in a different country, whether or not you agree with that, they're focusing on the bigger issues, the things that really matter. And so I urge you all to think about the issues that are actually impactful and the things that you really should be putting your time and stock into. And then over there as well, um, here you don't really see as many younger people getting into politics and stuff. Like people, oh my gosh, I don't even know how young. We're going to these protests. Mm -hmm. and like 10 and, years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was just so crazy. And like teenagers were just so passionate about independence or unity or whatever. And it was just so cool to see. Like they were actually into it. And when you asked them about it, they knew what was yeah. going on and they had real points. Not just like, oh yeah, yeah, it's just because I like it or whatever. Like, no, like they were like, no, because this has been going on too long and we need to do something about it now. And now that I'm here, I'm gonna do something <clears throat> about it and I'm gonna stand with my people. And it was, it was just awesome. Yeah. It was really nice to see, yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any time for q and I'm not sure what time this ends. It's probably not. Did anybody else up here want to add something? I, any Otherwise last comment? Time? I have Let's one thing here. to add that I think, um, I don't know if we talked about it, but something that was really impactful, um, at least for by the people that were in my host family, um, Mackenzie and I, was we got to witness Puigdemont, and he was the um, president of Catalonia. We sat down one night with our host mom and watched him declare independence. And so basically there was a lot of pressure on him, which he actually didn't show up the first time but then the second time he did. Um, and he said basically that he declared independence. And um, I remember just our host mom and her reaction. Mm -hmm. And it was, it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean it was anger, but it was like suppressed and calm. Like she knew, in, the fact that she was, in that moment I learned how much people undermine people from Catalonia because she knew it wouldn't make a difference. And she just basically talked him off and then some, the lady from Madrid, I can't remember, do you remember the woman from Madrid who spoke after him and then she took over? Um, I can't remember her name. Mm -hmm. The woman who took over Barcelona after Puigdemont. Oh, um, yeah, she's the um, yeah, her vice president. Yeah. Um, I can't remember, yeah, I can't remember her name, but. Um, she's the 
it's part really of, belittling. Yeah, very belittling. And also to add on to why it was such a big issue for Catalonia to leave was that um, they're part of the EU. And so if that happens, a lot of people can't have citizenship with the EU and they can't travel. And so that was her argument with them. And um, it just showed how belittling people were to Catalonia. And then he was actually arrested after that. So um, I just think that's important to understand that there is a lot going on that people don't know about and don't really have interest in. And I just learned while I was there that, I mean, traveling really showed me how important world politics are. And I think that that's the best way to learn, so. Hi. So, um, I don't think we have time for, it's on, it's on, okay. I don't think we have time for questions, unfortunately, but I want you to uh, please join me in thanking Jeanette Ediart and the five students who went on the trip to Barcelona. Um, for sharing their experience with us.